Lawrence Wright, uh, you wrote the nonfiction book, The Looming Tower, um, and you've brought it to Hulu as a limited series this year. Uh, now, first off, what, you know, how, how did you make the decision that you wanted to dramatize the book in the first place? Well, I didn't for so many years. Uh, it was, you know, I, that book was a kind of mission for me and it, probably the most important thing I'll ever do as a, as a writer. And I d didn't trust, you know, just turning it into a television show or a movie. And um, and there were a lot of overtures over the years. But uh, it became clear to me somebody was going to do something and um, uh, whether I liked it or not. And I decided I would have to take control of it. So I decided I would uh, become a producer and, and, and be in charge of it. And one thing that had changed over the years that I hadn't really factored in, although I should have, is how much television had changed over that period of time. You know, it's so much more interesting as a storytelling medium now because you have so much more room. Yeah, the budgets are great. You can hire great actors and great writers. And, you know, this had really, it really stunned me, you know, to think that we had 10 episodes to tell a portion of that story. And the other thing that it was, was motivating me was the, uh, the fact that young people that are going into college now weren't born. Um, when 9-11 happened. And those who are graduating from college were, were not old enough to appreciate how history changed. And I wanted, I thought, this is a great medium to introduce that stretch of history to a, a cadre of, of our population that really don't understand why we live in the country we do. And what was most important to you about uh, how you wanted to to bring you know this story to the screen? Like, well, what about the book was most important to you to preserve to to communicate? Well, you know, nine eleven is a hallowed part of our history. You have to be very careful in telling that story. There's a kind of sacred quality to it, and you don't want to exploit it. But it also has to be understood and appreciated. Uh, my feeling is that this, that part of history is still very unresolved and, uh, you know, it's a tragedy that has occurred, but we haven't really understood it. We haven't understood why it happened and we haven't understood why the country changed in the way that it has. And that's the message I wanted to get across. It was the main thing. I think the book addresses it, but time has passed, you know, since the book came out. And, uh, and honestly, I thought by now, Daniel, that uh, you know, there would be accountability for the actions that led to the failure to stop the 9-11 plot, but there hasn't been. So in some respects, the series is an attempt to draw attention to the failures and the people who did fail. And uh, going back to, to the book itself, uh, you know, given given how much uh, uh, you know, research is involved and, and, and the importance of, of the subject, how long was the process uh, just, just to get it written? The book, it took five years. And much of that time was, you know, traveling around the world, mainly in the Middle East and South Asia. So it was a long, lonely time. And uh, uh, I don't regret it, but it sure it was a very, very... It was a hard project to do, but you know, I you know I missed my family quite a lot during that period of time. But I was supported by the New Yorker, uh, which helped me. Uh, you know, it was a very expensive project, and uh, that was really helpful to me. And and you know, is, is it especially challenging to to try and research uh, you know an organization like the CIA, which of course is <laughs> yeah. secretive by nature? Uh, yeah, the, the two main sources were terrorists and spooks. <laughs> so yeah, there were there are in, innate problems uh, in dealing with people who have, you know those persuasions. But you know the truth is, Daniel, that you do the same thing you do with any subject. You know, when you go out into the world uh, and you're trying to report a subject, I th I see that there are like two axes. One is you go out and talk to everybody who will talk to you. And that's the horizontal axis. And it's probably the, the main rule of journalism is you talk to everybody you can. And uh, so and the way you populate that universe is, you know, if I know a couple of people that are involved in the story, I go talk to them. And then I ask, who else should I talk to? 
And every time I do that, uh, you know, the roots go deeper and deeper into the ground. And pretty soon you run out of new names. And that's the universe of people in that story. But there's another axis, which is some people are just simply more informed, more candid, uh, more amusing. You know, they're, they're just some people that are better sources. And uh, those people you go back to again and again. And that's more for understanding. You know, the, the horizontal axis is try to get a consensus of what actually happened. And then the vertical axis is one to try to get a deeper appreciation of the events that occurred. And that vertical and horizontal axis is the way, it's the journalist way, it's, it's the journalist route to truth. And, and, you know, how much, if any, uh, pushback were you getting, you know, to publishing the book or, or, or even now, even to making the series, maybe? Well, the CIA has always been very reluctant to be held to account for the failures to inform the FBI of the presence of Al Qaeda in America uh, well before 9-11. And, um, you know, this to me is, it's, since Pearl Harbor, you know, there hasn't been a greater intelligence failure in our country's history. And, uh, and, and you know, there's not been any kind of accounting. I, there, nobody's ever going to come to court for this. Um, but that was the thing that I felt was, uh, you know, I, I continually tried to get the CIA to comment on it when I was working uh, on my book. And, uh, and I did talk to people in the CIA, um, but they couldn't give me a satisfactory answer. And then when we began working on the series, um, they refused to talk to us. We did arrange to talk to former uh, CIA people. And it, we actually hired a, a, a woman who had been in Alex Station, the virtual bin Laden station inside the CIA. Uh, so we had, you know, informed people working with us. But the institution of the CIA and the former director, George Tennant, refused to walk with And uh, you know, the book won uh, you the Pulitzer Prize uh, for nonfiction. And of course, which is you know, among the highest honors you could receive for, for writing. Um, what was it like you know, when you were nominated for it and, and then when you won the, that award? Oh, that was, you know, <laughs> I really never won any awards before. I mean, in kindergarten, I was the best napper. <laughs> that was, I was not the kind of person that won many awards. And uh, so it was an amazing honor uh, to be selected. And, you know, especially that year, there were a lot of wonderful books that had come out. And honestly, before my book came out, there were a hundred books on 9-11. Um, you know, the fact that mine would have been selected out of that, you know, long list of, you know, very distinguished works uh, that was made the honor all the more wonderful for me. And, uh, you know, now this uh, limited series, uh, you, you worked with uh, Alex Gibney, uh, who's best known for, for documentaries and, and who uh, directed Going Clear and, and My Trip to Al Qaeda, which were based on your work. Uh, what was it like working with him? on on this kind of dramatized production as opposed to a documentary well you know, alex's nickname when he was a kid is tiger and uh, it's well earned you know i when i decided i wanted to you know try to put this on television and i knew i needed an ally and someone who was a stand-up guy and uh you know after doing that documentary on scientology i knew that uh that Alex is the kind of guy that if you're going to get in the trenches, he's the right guy. And um, he's a very creative mind. And, uh, you know, he has a, uh, he's got tremendous resources and experience. So that was, it turned out to be a terrific selection. And we're a good team. I'm, I'm very fond of Alex, but I really admire him as a filmmaker. And, and what's the difference between working on, you know, a dramatization like this uh, as opposed to uh, what it's like to, to, to make a documentary? Well, you know, it's, it is an interesting question because, uh, you know, people talk about fictionalizing it. Um, it's not exactly fictionalizing. 
You know, what we're trying to do is dramatize history. And uh, you know, as much as possible, we're, we're aiming to use the real events and the real characters. Some of our characters are composites or, and some time has been compressed simply for dramatic reasons. But, you know, as much as possible, we want people to understand that this is what happened. And, um, you know, that's been our goal is to portray history uh, in the way that we believe that it happened. And what were some of the biggest challenges, would you say, in, in you know, translating what you had written in the book to, uh, to, to this uh, telev televised format? Well, the first problem was what part of the book to do. You know, the, uh, the book begins uh, in, in 1948 when, you know, Said Qutb, this uh, Egyptian uh, uh, ideologue, uh, came to America. And, um, and it ends with 9-11. So uh, it, the decision was pretty obvious that we were going to use the last part of the book. Um, and... Yet, you know, the first part is all about the move, you know, the growth of uh, Islamic extremism in the Middle East. And we wanted to depict that side. And that was difficult, you know, representing the Al Qaeda community uh, is a touchy subject. And um, we decided to go ahead and do it. Uh, and, and to present their side, it's not the same thing as humanizing them. Although that is part of it, but you know, in in the past, I'm not sure people would have been ready uh, to look at the, the people that attacked America uh, analytically as we do, and uh, and and I I was pleased to see that the reaction was that it was good that we represented the other side of it as well. And you you also worked with uh, Dan Futterman on this. He's mm -hmm. he's done some work uh, uh, telling fact-based stories uh, as a writer. Uh, what was it like uh, working with him? Uh, Danny is, uh, he's, he, he's very, uh, seems like a quiet guy, but he's not. Uh, I mean, he's quiet, but he is, uh, he's a very determined artist. He's got such a, you know, a, a, a is almost an intrans intransigent way of, seeing the world and that you know that firmness of vision is what has actually made the series a success i think uh he knows exactly what he wants and um sometimes we have arguments about where we should go with the scene or a character and so on but those are very productive artistic arguments uh and i you know, it's been to me, you know, normally I don't collaborate with anybody, you know, and normally I'm in a room by myself. And uh, so to be in uh, the writer's room and working with Danny and the writers has been a lot of fun for me. It's interesting to get into other people's creative process because for the most part, my life has been lived with my own. And, uh, and you know, Telling this story now in 2018, uh, you know, you'd written the book more than 10 years ago, uh, and of course, 9/11 uh, was uh, a few years before that. What do you think the general public at this point uh, most mis misunderstands, or still misunderstands, about 9/11 and the years leading up to it? Well, there are two things. Uh, one is I, I don't think that they understand. The public doesn't seem to understand that 9/11 could have been stopped, should have been stopped and would have been stopped, I believe, had the CIA cooperated with the FBI when it asked about uh, certain details that would have led them to discover that Al-Qaeda was in America arriving in January of 2000. This is, you know, 90, 21 months before 9-11. Uh, it's just uh, unforgivable that, uh, that the CIA withheld that information. And the other thing I think that especially young people don't understand is what America was like before 9-11. Um, when I was in high school, um, when I was their age, uh, I remember living in Dallas. I took my girlfriend to the airport and you could do that back then. Uh, it was a cheap date. It was called Love Field so <laughs> for other reasons, I suppose. But 
we walked out on the tarmac and went into uh, some jetliner that had just come from Europe. We decided from Paris, and uh, and the uh, stewardess, as we called them, then, brought us a snack. And then we went up in the FAA tower. It was unlocked, and you walk in, and they oh come on in, kids, and we sat there, and they, they let us watch them uh, as they landed planes. And that was America. It was there was a kind of freedom that we had then that we don't have now. Terrorism killed that. And I, I, I don't think we'll get back to that anytime soon. But if we forget it, uh, that, that that was the country we had, then in some ways I think that terrorism has won. And, uh, and, and, you know, having covered this story about what the CIA and the FBI and the government was like at that time, how do you reflect on that now, considering how the CIA and the FBI and the government are, are today? What, what are your thoughts about the current state of, of government and preparedness? Well, and we're in far better shape that way than we were before 9-11. There's no question about that. Um, the intelligence community has been reorganized. There's been a, they created the National Counterterrorism Center and we a place where intelligence agents from our 17 different agencies are compelled to sit together and share information. It's not perfect. I'm not saying it's solved altogether, but it's much better. Our relationship with um, foreign intelligence agencies is also much better. Uh, and so, you know, we have been able to prevent some you know wide-scale attacks uh, not all anyway, there have been attacks and especially in Europe uh, so the country both the, all of the West is still in peril but the thing that I want to underside uh, I want people to understand that I don't think they do uh, al-qaeda has also grown in Europe. Uh, on 9/11 there were about 400 people in al-qaeda and now al-qaeda is in 18 countries um, there are tens of thousands of people in Al-Qaeda, and that's not counting their progeny like ISIS and Boko Haram and so on. They're, you know, the, the, the Islamist movement, the jihadist movement has proliferated, and, uh, and their intentions haven't changed. So the, even with, you know, the rout of, of ISIS, for instance, uh, that doesn't mean that that movement has died. It's just moved on and it's moving back into the countries where they came from. So you know, we are not at the end of the age of terror. We're certainly, I'm not going to say we're at the beginning, but we're deep in the middle. And, and there's a you know, debate in, within, you know, between the characters in uh, the series about uh, you know, how much uh, you know, American foreign policy uh, uh, you know, radicalizes uh, people in the Middle East and, and uh, uh, throughout the Muslim community. Uh, throughout the world, uh, you know, do you think like in the age of the Muslim ban and, and stuff like that, do you think in, in, in some ways we're, we're adding fuel to the fire even now? Well, the Muslim ban does do that. Uh, the uh, one, you have to realize that the main people who are fighting uh, Islamic extremism are Muslims. And, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, our allies in the Middle East, in Jordan and Egypt and Lebanon and you know places like that, they're on the front lines, and um, and we are working with them. But this is needlessly alienating an entire religion is not going to help us in our pursuit of uh, trying to contain the extremist portion of that religion. And I think um, we have we have a conundrum. Uh, which is that, you know, we could withdraw uh, from Syria, from Afghanistan, from Iraq. Um, and there's an argument to be made that that would uh, you know, diminish the, the antagonism toward America. It might. Uh, on the other hand, what we've seen in the past is that in chaotic and uncontrolled situations, as in Afghanistan under the Taliban, uh, terrorism is allowed to grow. And, and the training camps spring up, and that's where things get really dangerous, where people go to get trained and, and without any kind of uh, resistance from, from the West, uh, things can get very dangerous. So on the one hand, you know, provocative actions on our part, 
for instance, being involved in, in those Middle Eastern countries does cause people to be antagonistic towards America. And doing nothing also causes uh, terrorism to have the opportunity to spread and grow. So that's the conundrum that we face as a nation. We have to weigh which of those alternatives is safest for us. Well, I want to uh, congratulate you on on the Looming Tower, um, uh, you know, the series which is uh, now available to to watch in its entirety on Hulu. Um, and and thank you so much uh, for talking with me today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me.